Can it be contained? The World Health Organization's emergency committee meeting uh, for the third time in under two weeks, the coronavirus continuing to spread globally. The UN agency stating it's not nearly as deadly as the 2003 SARS epidemic that killed nearly 800. But the WHO boss also apologizing for minimizing the risk at the outset. Should it have been declared a global emergency sooner? Was there political pressure on the part of China, with airlines suspending flights and foreign countries organizing airlifts of their citizens? The stakes are immense. We'll evaluate the real dangers. And as the country scrambles, putting the, its epicenter Wuhan under quarantine, we'll assess crisis management in a China where decision making is more than ever top down and where a tighter than ever control on information can prove a double-edged sword in this kind of situation when authorities are trying to prevent panic. We'll ask about China's persistent image abroad, its image problem abroad, and the backlash against that backlash here in France with Asians, not just those of Chinese origin, speaking out against the casual everyday racism they've been subjected to since the outbreak of this current crisis. Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking how to contain the coronavirus uh, uh, outbreak and joining us from London is uh, Richard Horton, editor of uh, the uh, science journal The Lancet. Thank you for being with us. Pleasure. China consultant uh, Jean-Paul Chang is with us as well. Welcome back to the show. Uh, André Lezikog Petri, a political commentator, founder of A Capital. Good evening. Nice to see you. And uh, France 24's very own Julia Kim. Hi, Francois. How are you? Good, thank you. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. The hashtag is F24Debate. Yeah, after asking how you keep a city of 11 million under quarantine, here's a new one for you. How do you keep a 4,250-kilometer border shut? Today, we're informing everyone about measures taken to close the border with China. We have to do everything to protect our people. Uh, Mongolia already made such an announcement. Jean-Paul Chang, how's it going to go, uh, the Russians closing the border with China? In um, not delivering visas, uh, for instance, because the Chinese citizens need visas to go to Russia. And uh, it's um, actually you have, you have uh, uh, some uh, uh, some points on the Chinese-Russian border in the Manchuria, uh, in along the Heilongjiang River, uh, Khabarovsk, uh, Manjoli. That's the main key points where the Chinese citizen uh, just trade with uh, the other side, and so it's quite easy to to stop this. Stop the trade? Uh, so, yeah, so stop the contract, the the, the, the contact, and uh, people crossing the border. It's not a big deal actually. Why is it not a big deal? Because the, it's a limited point of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, border opening between China and Russia uh, in the northeast of China border. Uh, so it's not so, uh, you know. Are the, are rest, the Russians overreacting? No, no. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a precaution. But it's not a big deal because along these 4,000 kilometers, you have a lot of places where, where there's no, uh, no life, no... In, uh, habitants and uh, no traffic, you know. So the main traffic is between the Chinese Manchuria and the, 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 the east part of Siberia. So, and, and that's a limited number of uh, uh, point of, uh, of border uh, checking. So, uh, you know, Manjoli, uh, uh, Habarovsk uh, on the east side, and it's very quite easy to, to say, okay, we just stop. The bus are not passing through the bridge, the train are stopped, and not uh, bringing the passenger in. And I, I imagine that it's not an a, a impossible thing. Right, and then a lot of the news coverage this Thursday has been over what is a, a sensible precaution and what is overreaction. A long way from the Russian border, uh, the Italian port of uh, uh, Civita Vecchia, north of Rome. 6,000 passengers aboard the Costa Smeralda were screened after a 54-year-old woman from Macau came down with flu-like symptoms. She and her partner put under isolation, and they now appear to have tested negative. Uh, be it in Italy or here in France, is it fear that's contagious? 
We get some ridiculous questions, like, I walked past a Chinese-looking person in the streets and he coughed near me. Should I be worried? Let's say we receive about 100 calls a day about the coronavirus. Only about 10% of them lead to actual medical tests. Uh, Richard Horton, your, your reaction to what uh, the head of the Paris paramedics says there? Well, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the anxiety that people feel. Um, you've got an epidemic that is literally uh, overwhelming China. Every single province is ch in China is now affected uh, with cases of coronavirus infection, and it is now seeding itself around the world. Um, so it's understandable that people are anxious, but that's why it's so important that we have very good and really quite assertive public information to make sure that people understand that this is uh, an acute respiratory tract infection that is moderately transmissible, um, but which is, uh, has a very a low, as far as we can tell, a very low risk of severe complications. So I think we need to be much better at our public information. And it's the lack of public information, not only in China, but also in other countries, that is fueling this public anxiety. So are the measures that have been taken overreaction, like uh, suspending flights, like closing borders? So I think the reaction in China of isolating cities, and it's not just Wuhan, there's another 14 cities in Hubei province, they've basically locked down an entire province of up to 50 million people. Um, those responses are the right responses if you want to extinguish an epidemic. So that's, the, that's a good thing to do. The, the part that's going wrong is that there is a lot of misinformation that is out there and not enough information is being given to the public about the risks and the dangers and what they should do. And that's what can then fuel not only anxiety but actually civil unrest. And that was, that's my concern, that the Chinese authorities need to do a much better job of empowering their local public health leaders to talk to the public. Our information is that people have been told that they're not allowed to speak to the media, they're not allowed to speak to the public. And in that vacuum, that's where you will get problems. Uh, that, that, so what is the misinformation that, you, that we're getting? So that's lack of information you're describing. What's the misinformation and who's, who's, uh, who's giving out this misinformation? Well, there's a lot of fake news that's now beginning to circulate. Um, I'll give you some examples. There's, uh, cause, what's the origin of this virus um, is, is one question. Uh, was it the seafood market uh, in Wuhan? There's a rumor that's circulating that somehow it might be a bioweapon in a biosafety level for a laboratory in Wuhan that had some connection to the United States. There's absolutely no evidence to support that whatsoever. But those are the kind of rumors that are spreading because there's not enough information that's being put out there um, by the Chinese authorities. And that is just going to scare people even more. And that then leads to them wanting to escape Wuhan, whereas actually what you need is that they stay in their homes, there's no public gatherings, and you have social distancing. Um, and if you don't have good information, people are going to do exactly the opposite of what's necessary. Andre Luzikud Pretri, that's that's what a, a, the, the 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 reporters that are on the ground are saying that uh, people locally in Wuhan are pleased with the way authorities are handling the crisis. They accept perfectly well the concept of the of the lockdown, but it is true that there is frustration over the lack of information. I mean, we're really, t I think this, this crisis it's, is dramatic, but it's also really symbolic. It's a bit the test of the systems, is can a top-down system like China is be efficient, because it's all about efficiency, in handling of this crisis? And indeed, I mean, in no other part of the world would we have been able to lock down 50 million people 
in quarantine, as, as Mr. Horton said. Then on the other side, do we want to accept that? This is, is almost, almost a, a moral principle. Then on the information, uh, I, yes, I, I understand that the, the, the lack of information is probably the critical thing where the Chinese have been uh, extremely um, uh, poor on. But on the other side, let's not forget, this is an unfolding story. Um, there are, there is, it's not clear yet whether people are, for example, contagious before they have symptoms or not. So this lack of uncertainty makes it actually difficult for, for, for anybody to actually comment on it. Uh, we, 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 indeed, the transparency is important to avoid uh, these fake news like the one which was... But on the other side, being very assertive about the, the, the type of transmission, uh, when are you contagious, what should be done. I, I think it's, we are really seeing these 21st century crises which are combining globality, I mean, it's a global crisis, speed, I mean, it's a speed we have never seen before in just three weeks. This has spread all over. And, f and third, this, this, this dilemma for, p for political leaders is, do they need to be over-precautious? And then they lock down the whole country with the risk of also creating a lot of anxiety. And those, like, for example, the French Minister of, of Health or, or the head of or, or WHO, who now needs to apologize, who at the beginning said, well, actually, the morbidity, the mortality is much lower than SARS was. So it's not that acute of crisis. There was that, that front page headline in Le Monde Wednesday evening, the French daily newspaper, which quoted uh, unnamed sources at the WHO saying China had pressured the World Health Organization into minimizing the risk. Well, the, the, the challenge here is that the WHO had already a track record, remember the Ebola crisis, where part of their understating of the, of the importance was responsible for the initial outbreak. And it probably, with a tougher response of WHO, uh, this, this outbreak of, of the Ebola virus uh, could, have been, uh, could have been contained much, much earlier. And as you remember, it was, it was extremely deadly. I mean, it's a real dilemma, because either you go in a society where, as soon as there's a little risk, you lock down everything, the famous principe de précaution in French, or you, you have some kind of acceptable risk, because at the end of the day, uh, uh, if there is risk, uh, we will end up in a society where nothing is, is possible anymore. 2003, the SARS outbreak, uh, there were nearly 800 killed, much deadlier if you, if you look at the statistics. Of course, in those days, the Chinese didn't travel the way they do today, and you didn't have the internet. Exactly. And so now what we're seeing here in France, especially um, from, you know, the cases that I've been looking at online, there are a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence um, a lot of um, Chinese people and a lot of French people of Asian origin, not necessarily Chinese, being taken, being mistaken for Chinese people, Chinese tourists, um, who are suspected of carrying this virus. And, you know, from what we know so far, only five cases exist at the moment in the country. They've all been contained. And yet there is this kind of uh, cloud of suspicion um, over all Asian people in this country. And we're seeing it in the metro, we're seeing it in shops, on the street, day-to-day -day interactions are now colored by this kind of fear that people have. And it does boil down to a lack of information. We don't really know um, exactly what the symptoms are. You know, people are saying that the first week it takes about seven to 12 days to incubate, that it's a asymptomatic, but we haven't had any confirmation about this. So as a result, people are drawing their own conclusions and trying to keep safe by avoiding and uh, frankly discriminating. Is that, anybody, is that anybody's fault? It's just too early to tell. I, I mean, I guess so. But then at the same time, it really does. People have pointed out that it's kind of uncovered this underlying racism, anti-Asian racism mm. in France. That's not very publicized. That's almost minimized compared to racism, you know, towards Jewish people or racism towards Muslim people in society. So minorities that are much more prominent in this country. I, I, if, if I may say, I saw one of the titles in, in your initial uh, uh, um, uh, story on the Courrier Picard was titling yeah, it's a, a local newspaper, a regional Alerte newspaper. Jaune. Exactly. I think the this yellow is alert. Outrageous. And the, uh, this and kind of I'm I'm for liberty of the press, but this is really for me blatant right they had racism. An, they had oh. another headline which was uh, Nouveau Peril Jaune, you know, exactly. new yellow the, peril. I mean, this is the kind of language that we it was saw eighty years ago. Exactly, right? you know. 
decades ago, the post-colonial era, how could they be bringing that back to describe this epidemic? It's very irresponsible. Uh, Richard Horton, wh what's, been, what's the coverage been like where you are? Uh, in the United Kingdom, there is a great deal of anxiety um, uh, that's, uh, that's present, but I don't think we've seen any of the what you've just described uh, as racism against people from China or from the Asian subcontinent. Um, in the streets of London, you are seeing some people wearing masks, face masks, um, but uh, not very many. Um, I don't think that it's quite captured the imagination uh, that it has in other parts of Europe at the moment. But there, that's a very dangerous, um, very dangerous fallacy that we may be living. Um, we, we think we're an island and that somehow we might be protected, um, but there's absolutely no reason to think we'll be protected and it will definitely reach the shores of Great Britain at some point. One of the issues that's come up is face masks in the United States. Uh, uh, there was an article in the New York Times this Thursday, the fear that healthy people are hoarding them uh, like the ones produced in this factory in Thailand. Medical authorities warn there aren't enough for hospitals and those who are actually sick, uh, like in Hong Kong, where uh, there have been 10 cases so far. And here, uh, filmed by our colleagues from AFP, are the images of people lining up to buy uh, more of those uh, face masks Again, this Jean-Paul Chang, it's uh, what, what André was describing earlier, how this sort of anxiety has gone global. Um, maybe it's too early to say that it's going uh, global. I mean, uh, because the Chinese government deploys a huge uh, actions to contain uh, the spreading of the virus. Uh, nobody can say that it will be successful or not. Uh, right now, the, the number of uh, victims are still growing, and uh, the number of declared case, cases uh, uh, is growing uh, as well. But uh, uh, the risk is, of course, a global uh, pandemic or something like that. You pandemic. Know, uh, pandemic uh, uh, progression. Uh, but uh, no, nobody can be sure. So uh, in the meantime, uh, should we be uh, hysterical about that? That's, I'm, I'm not so sure. And uh, uh, listening to my uh, neighbor, uh, we live in an age where news travels fast. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so far, I believe that in China, okay, we got the time of uh, rumors at the beginning. You have a lot of fake news uh, rumors, but now you know it's uh, six days now after the New Year's, and people are accustomed to to, to stay at home, and the mind. Uh, the general man looks more calm, and people are not taking too seriously all these rumors, you know. And and uh, you have the rumors about the, the shortage of masks, uh, the rumor about uh, the medical uh, team uh, uh, dying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and actually, the government, I mean, the central one, and also now the local one. They are making an unprecedented effort of uh, information and transparency. You know, uh, I just give mm -hmm. the example of the press conference of the responsible of the Hubei province and the mayor of Wuhan. You know, they've been cursed by journalists. You know, uh, publicly on the TV. Yeah, they, they apologized in public. We're going to pick up on that point when okay. we come back. Stay okay. with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate, and we're looking at uh, the coronavirus outbreak and the uh, world reaction to it. Joining us from London, Richard Horton, who is uh, the is editor at uh, the uh, science journal The Lancet. Welcome back as well uh, to Jean-Paul Chang, China consultant, uh, uh, political cons uh, political commentator, and founder of A Capital, André lezecrug Petri, and France 24's very own uh, Julia Kim. Yeah, suspicions about the uh, credibility of the information out of Beijing, tempered by uh, awe at the ability of the Chinese to mobilize. State broadcaster CCTV sending uh, this update on the building in under two weeks of not one but two makeshift hospitals 
that are due to open next Monday. First, we were understaffed and we had to work two shifts, 12 hours a shift. Now, as more and more workers have come to help us from all over the country, we're working three shifts. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about those two makeshift hospitals here. <laughs> I mean, I, I tell you, I think we're, what we're seeing today is a battle of the systems. I think, uh, I mean, we're talking obviously about... about because at first it was reported as they were building hospitals from scratch. They're not yeah. building them from scratch, right? No, no, no. It's, 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 it's prefab. But, uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure in the, in the back of the head of the political leaders in China, uh, you know, how to make a good... Uh, I don't want to go in, into the typical cliche about crisis and opportunity, but this crisis might actually be an opportunity for the leaders to, number one, demonstrate their transparency. And I understand perfectly Mr. Horton when he says at the local level, but it's a fact that the, at the national level, the Chinese have understood that it makes no sense to hoard the information. Point number one. Well, they, 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 did, they didn't the understand government. it until last Monday when, when the president weighed in. Absolutely. And probably it's again one of these cases where actually the local level of the Communist Party, of the leaders, uh, you know, are worried about getting the information up because they are, they are worried of getting, uh, uh, of getting uh, you know, punished or, or whatever. And the second thing is how to make, um, uh, to actually demonstrate that some kind of a control on the population, on the railroads. You, you have an amazing and a lot of technology discussions right now. There are a lot of people talking about how the railways, the bus systems are actually sharing big data in order for everybody to know if he was in contact or not of, um, of, uh, of, of somebody who had, uh, who had the symptoms, etc. So actually you're using artificial intelligence uh, in order to, to track something which was impossible just two or three years ago. So I think in the, it, it might be a way for the system to also demonstrate that this kind of organization can be extremely efficient in what is probably the biggest fear of the 21st century, which is, uh, which is a pandemia. Yeah. Richard Horton, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I fully agree with uh, those comments. The people we know in the National Health Commission in Beijing, that's their Ministry of Health, um, they're extremely sophisticated in their analysis and thinking. They know full well they have to be transparent with the information. They all have good contacts with the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta in the United States. Um, they work all the time with these uh, organizations and individuals there. Um, so there's maximum collaboration. It's at the local level. So if you look in Wuhan, the very first case, as far as we know, was diagnosed on December the 1st. Uh, and then there was a period of four to five weeks where nothing happened. Basically, there was a total lockdown in information, a denial that there was any infection taking place. And it wasn't until, I think, January the 23rd or so, or early January, when Wuhan was actually locked down. So that period of four or five weeks uh, allowed uh, flights and high-speed rail links to transport literally millions of people from this major city of 11 million people around the country, seeding the infection in other Chinese cities and also internationally. So that was the difficulty, that people locally were so frightened to disclose any information. And that's the, that's the quid pro quo you have with a top-down system. Yes, you can do this amazing quarantine, this, this lockdown, and, and really have a, a really a very impressive public health response. But the cost is what, you're, what you see at the local level, where people are frightened, not just for their jobs, but for their lives, in terms of what they say to the public or report centrally. Richard, you say it works at the national level. We've heard grumblings here in Paris because the Pasteur Institute uh, uh, has um, uh, dealings for a long time. There, there have been long time relations with the city of Wuhan. They say they're not getting enough information. That's what some doctors are saying. What, what, what have you found? Well, our, we're receiving information every day from the National Health Commission, from China's Centers for Disease Control, um, from the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences, information about the evolution of the epidemic, information about the clinical course of the epidemic, information about the 
uh, how rapidly the epidemic might be spreading, how infective the epidemic is. So we're getting a constant stream of information from Chinese scientists, literally on a day-by-day -day basis. So we're not seeing any unwillingness to share information. On the contrary, we're seeing this desperate urge to share information, to build confidence with the international community that China knows what it's doing. Because one of the things China doesn't want to happen is what's taking place right now, which is this meeting of the International Health Regulations Emergency Committee. They don't want a public health emergency of international concern declared against China, because that will suggest that China's not in control of the situation. But a fake is going to be declared, I'm 99.9% .9 sure of it, and that's going to be a severe blow to Chinese credibility uh, and their confidence about how they manage such an epidemic. Of the meeting, the head of the World Health Organization apologizing for minimizing the threat while at the same time praising China's mobilization in its effort to contain the outbreak. I will praise China again and again because its actions actually helped in reducing the spread of coronavirus to other countries. So, of course, there are politics involved when you have an organization like the WHO. Uh, Jean-Paul Chang, you just heard Richard Horton say that uh, for China, having this being declared a global emergency would only be the sixth time in history. Uh, it, it's a setback, a blow for the Chinese. Of course, of course. Uh, that's why they hope that uh, it will not be declared, but uh, there's no chance uh, that will happen. So uh, the, the thing is, politics are involved, but the present leadership in China, you always have to remember that when Xi Jinping and his team came to the power, they, they are, they, they, they are basic uh, principle is to face crisis, whatever could be, financial crisis, sanitary crisis, political crisis, etc. And so they've been teaching all the members of the parties and the government to face crisis. So when you have the crisis situation, you are not surprised that uh, they are reacting as uh, they, are, they are doing at the national level, at least. And uh, uh, so some, somewhere I, I agree that uh, they want to make a show that uh, uh, they are efficient in the mobilization to contain this virus, etc. But the, the, the key point is the, the, the internal politics in China. Okay? As, f uh, as far as the Chinese public opinion, the domestic domestic opinion, stay calm and uh, not panicking too much and uh, joining the effort of containing the a virus, not only in Hubei, but now even in town like Beijing, even in some village around Beijing, you know, people are uh, taking um, automatically the, the kind of measure to control people coming out and uh, getting out from the village to take the temperature, etc. So as long as the population uh, participate uh, actively to this containment effort, I believe it's too early to talk politics. You know, nobody's thinking about politics right now. Uh, maybe uh, outside, outside of China, yes, Mr. Pompeo saying that the biggest threat is the Chinese Communist Party. But in China, uh, the, the virus is the biggest threat right now. So people don't care about politics still. So on the diplomatic front, even if the WHO declare the state of emergency, I don't believe that will change the behavior of the Chinese leadership. They are continue to, to show that they are able to control the situation. Able to control the situation. And as you mentioned, Jean-Paul Chang, there's a dichotomy between uh, the how this crisis is being managed, its image domestically and the image abroad. And this crisis, as Julia Kim was telling us earlier, angering French nationals of Asian descent who've called out the casual racism they've endured nowhere more than in Paris's Chinatown, where they've had to cancel the Lunar New Year parade and where, well, the mood this Thursday was as glum as the weather when our team went out. Mario Sophos has more. For this Asian supermarket, January is usually one of its busiest periods as Paris's Chinese community prepares to celebrate the new year. 
However, this year, due to concerns over the spread of coronavirus, the festivities, including the customary parade, will not go ahead this weekend much to the disappointment of the supermarket's owner. This time last year, our sales increased by 15 to 20 percent, which we have not seen this year. Social media tends to exaggerate. In France, we are far from the epicenter of the virus. Only five cases have been confirmed in France, however the country's Asian community feels stigmatized. People look at us strangely in the metro. I got a message from a friend. He entered a full metro train with a mask on, and everyone left. <laughs> I'm Vietnamese, but they think I'm Chinese, so in the metro, on the street or in the neighborhood, they're going to avoid me. In this district of Paris, coronavirus is at the forefront of many people's minds. But residents don't want to give in to hysteria. We're in France. We're well protected. It doesn't bother me. And if I want to go to an Asian restaurant, this wouldn't stop me. Anything can happen, anywhere and to anybody. We have to live normally. We've got to remain calm. A call for calm and common sense echoed by a number of associations who are asking people to rebuke racism against Asian people via social media using the hashtag I am not a virus. Je ne suis pas un virus, I'm not a virus. Uh, Julie Kim, you're not of Chinese descent. No, I've actually never even been to China, but um, try telling that to everyone that looks at me sideways. And Has this you know, crisis been an eye-opener? It has, actually. Um, you know, it's actually confirmed what a lot of people have told me when I moved to France, which is that anti-Asian racism exists. It's there, except it's, you know, usually always minimized because uh, Asians as a minority in France are underrepresented. Um, and, you know, frankly, they don't, they're not very confrontational. They won't speak out as often as, say, people from perhaps other ethnic groups. I mean, maybe I am generalizing, but there haven't been, you know, riots or anything by Asian people in France. There today. have been of late. There have been more demonstrations, most notably in the northeastern suburb of Aubervilliers after the killing of... Exactly, uh, yes. But it takes a killing, for example, to, to engender this kind of response. Um, Asian people are underrepresented in media. They're underrepresented um, in many aspects of French culture. And as a result, racism towards them is almost accepted. It's definitely minimized to the point where when you bring it up, people will just dismiss it and say, well, it's a joke. You know, it's, you know, why are you being so sensitive? Um, and, you know, reactions like that, uh, I frankly find quite offensive. But it's it is the reality that people of Asian origin, not necessarily Chinese, face day to day. And this virus has just brought all of that up to the fore. Jean-Paul Chang, is it the same as it's always been? No, I think that uh, hey, now, now for two or three years, uh, the, the, the speech in the mainstream media is China equal evil. Uh, so everything, everything coming from China is suspicious and bad, uh, from the technology Huawei uh, till the violation of uh, human rights, etc., etc., etc. So it's very easy to uh, to nourish this feeling of uh, defiance, uh, the uh, suspicion vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the Chinese, you know. And uh, so I believe that uh, there, there's a kind of a continuity between... Uh, so you're saying it's getting worse? Ah, yeah, of course. I, I believe that the, the, the speech about China switched completely in West Europe and in, in the Western world now for two or three years, you know, from sympathy, uh, uh, strategic partnership, etc. It's becoming... Uh, uh, rival, uh, systematic rival, uh, aggressor, uh, greedy, etc., etc. So now you know they are bringing us all this trouble with the sanitary crisis. So somehow, uh, plus the deep-rooted racism uh, inherited from the past, uh, yellow peril. And France has a colonial heritage. In yeah, South, exactly. In so Southeast Asia. all these, uh, it, it, we've been politicizing China on everything, on, on trade. Uh, on uh, human rights, on uh, uh, political system, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, how can we stop suddenly, because we have this sanitary crisis, not to politicize? So you have immediately, you have this uh, uh, interrogation in the West about the credibility of the Chinese authorities, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a kind of continuum. 
So this crisis is revealing a lot of things, not only in China, but also outside of China. Anyway, I mean, a crisis is always a moment to reveal the strength and the weakness of a society. All right, he didn't mention coronavirus when he was in London, but the U.S. Secretary of State, as Jean-Paul Chang was saying, uh, did have some choice words when he spoke earlier uh, in, alongside his uh, U.K. counterpart. While we still have to be enormously vigilant about terror, there's still challenges uh, all across the world. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party presents the central threat of our times. Uh, it is uh, an enormous economy to which the American economy is deeply tied. There is huge opportunity for us to do uh, really great, creative, innovative business work between our two countries. But the Chinese Communist Party, under President Xi, has made clear uh, that they have an agenda that is not always consistent with the very values that uh, Dominic and I have been speaking about this morning. Richard Horton, The Lancet, uh, you don't have political columns. Uh, it's a science newspaper, a science journal. Uh, nonetheless, does the current conversation politically sort of bleed into uh, what you report on? Yeah, I mean, we've been working uh, in China for the past decade um, with the government and with academic institutions. Uh, and this demonization of China that we're seeing from some of our most senior political leaders, I find deeply disturbing. Um, the people that we've worked with, that's health workers, doctors, nurses, uh, people in the Ministry of Health, these are people who are deeply committed to advancing the health of the Chinese people. Uh, China's taken hundreds of millions of people out of poverty within a generation or two. And those, that new middle class is desperate to be able to send their children to good schools and to have access to a good and reliable health care system as we do in Europe. Their aspirations are no different to our aspirations. And there is a group of people in the, in, the, in the health system there, in their health service, who want to provide that level of health care. Um, so to demonize China in the way that it is being demonized as some evil empire, an evil country that has malign intentions, this is just not the China I know. I go, I go to China regularly. I know many Chinese colleagues, many friends in China. This is not the China of today. And I think the way the country is being portrayed is deeply unfair. It's not true. And it fosters the fears and anxieties, some of which we're seeing played out today. Piotr? Well, I would take a step uh, back here because I think we are mixing the system, the political system, and the people. I myself also lived 10 years in China, and I would, you know, completely second what I've heard about the people themselves. The fact that it has become very clear since a couple of years that the political systems in the world are getting apart and not getting together, this is also a fact. And that today I would call the humanistic, liberal, democratic uh, societies, which I'm not sure Mr. Pompeo is representative of, which makes it pretty interesting to hear him about it. I think it's the European countries who should be worried about this battle of systems. Uh, are we for uh, liberal, human-centric uh, society, or are we going towards systems which are proving their efficiency on the economic front, and maybe also probably on, on, on solving these... these uh, and I think it's a, it's a real dilemma. I don't have a solution to that. But it, I, I think we need to acknowledge that systems are going away and systems are linked with values. And I personally, I feel very European uh, these days. So I, I just hope that the Europeans will get their acts together in order. I think if the democracies don't get the efficiency, the boldness, the capacity to also, um, you know, give to their people what, what is expected from, from political leaders, then we will have increasingly a large part of the populations and by the CEOs who come back from China, this appeal saying we are not necessarily in accordance with the systems, but these people get things done. I think this is a peril for us. It's not against, but it's a question for us to, to ask. Europe in the middle, Julia Kim? I think Europe has a responsibility to really promote their values of openness and tolerance and diversity. Um, it's not fair to lump every Asian country um, in with you know, China 
And it's not all, it's not fair either to discriminate against all Chinese people um, as carriers of the virus. I think there is a responsibility to educate people. Um, and sadly, it's it's been really lacking from what I've seen here in France. And I would love for people to really, you know, for this uh, crisis to become an opportunity to get people together, to bring people together and have conversations. Because, you know, it is a perfect opportunity to do so. This crisis affects everyone. The virus isn't racist. The virus will latch on to any living human being. This is a human problem, not just a Chinese problem. I mean, this is really a global mm. crisis. And probably we are lucky, if and I can call that like that, I talk under the control of Mr. Horton, that actually the mortality of this. But imagine a pandemia that would be really... I mean, we would experience for the first time in our history a global crisis that unfolds in a few days. And perhaps more, more blaming and scapegoating, which is something we want to avoid. Uh, absolutely. Andre Lezakyuk Pietri, I want to thank you. I want to yeah. thank Richard Horton for joining us uh, from London. Jean Paul Chang, okay. Julia Kim. Please stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So indeed, uh, that hashtag, I am not a virus, has been doing the rounds of uh, French social media now for a number of days. It's probably not as being used as much as uh, a couple of days ago. It seems to be on a downward curve. But this is a video, I think it was actually Julia, uh, Julia came here who flagged it uh, to me. And it's an example of the sort of fear factor uh, that has just got blown out of been blown out of proportion entirely. So you, I think this is probably on a rail link to one of the Paris airports and you can see the degree of paranoia and oh uh, fear. Uh, they don't appear to be in any way ill. Um, but you know, they're Asian. So that seems to be uh, the, 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 the kind of the extent of, uh, um, I suppose, um, the sophistication of analysis of the of the real risk. Uh, and of course, uh, that hashtag that you were mentioning earlier, Francois, uh, started off uh, with images such as this being shared on social media. That is a Chinese man uh, resident in France. Uh, je suis chinois, I am Chinese, but I'm not a virus. And that was an example of the early sort of images that were going around social media. Even today, Le Monde has been kind of keeping tabs with all of this. Keep your virus, you dirty Chinese woman is the direct translation of that headline. And that is the kind of stuff that has been reported. Um, uh, there have been huge amounts of uh, tweets going up online, people relaying situations where um, people uh, of Asian ethnicity are being asked to get out of public transport, get out of trains, not no. being allowed into Ubers. So it's, it's, it's reached proportions that are uh, utterly, uh, uh, utterly racist and, uh, uh, and unacceptable, I think it's fair to say. Um, so that's the fear factor. There's also been a lot of coverage as well of the fake news factor. I suppose you, uh, you could argue uh, they sort of go together. A lot of different media have been looking at uh, elements of fake news that have been circulating. For example, uh, a theory that it all started with bat soup. Uh, that's incorrect. And indeed, the travel host of that particular, uh, there was a scene where, where this lady here uh, by the name of Wang Mengyun, She's a host of an online travel show. She was eating the dish in, the, in an island of Palau, nowhere, which is in the Western Pacific. It's not in China at all. And that was sort of uh, gone, it went viral as sort of uh, one explanation for the origin of the virus, even though there is potentially a connection with mm. bats. But of course, uh, if there's a grain of truth, then that's where the whole thing uh, explodes into utter uh, fake news. This is AFP, uh, French news agency's fact-checking um, website. And this is the mar a photo of a market where the uh, uh, virus was thought to have originated also uh, fake. Um, there were also reports then uh, of, of the virus uh, being uh, detected in Argentay, one of the That's Paris suburbs. Northwestern suburb of Paris. That's right. Uh, that is was fake news as well. The local hospital uh, was tweeting about that. So there are many, many, many examples of uh, uh, this fear factor. Now, uh, there have been some uh, interviews with philosophers and historians about, about uh, all of this. Uh, the French edition of the Huffington Post has been looking uh, at that. They interviewed Yves-Marie Berset, who is a an historian, and he said, look, this happened with the bubonic plague. You had a, a sense that the, the Jews were putting, a, were, were poisoning public fountains. Lepers were, at, back, in, back in the day as well, massacred. Uh, so uh, where you have a broad reach or a broad effect, there's this sense that the cause must also be something uh, large and, and awful. And a cons a conspiracy theories uh, tend to accompany uh, pandemics uh, very often. Uh, so there you go. Um, 
lots of examples of it. Even the, the HIV virus that was thought to have been cooked up in CIA uh, labs, and that was a theory that many people believed, and perhaps some still do. So. All right, James Creedon, many thanks. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.